Hello and welcome to Cardio Live. I'm James Bagger, I'm the founder of Cardio Magazine, and today I'm delighted to be chatting to Dash Gupta, CEO of Marshall Motor Group. Dash, good afternoon. Hi James, how are you doing? Really good. Uh, very, very nice of you to give up your time for us once again. Thank you very much. Um, Dash, we've been for an incredibly turbulent time over the last couple of uh, last couple of months. We've spoken regularly during that time, and I know you've been you've been working very hard. Give me a quick update, um, and those who are watching, just how how business has been in this in this restart month. So it's been busy, to be fair. I think uh, one thing I would say, James, unfortunately, because we're now in a closed period, because we announced our results uh, in a few weeks' time. In fact, uh, sort of second or third week of uh, August. So. Uh, we're, uh, I can't give you too much specifics, but uh, obviously you'll be aware the market's very strong. Uh, we're clearly seeing those signs as well. Um, I think some interesting trends that are happening, um, and, and I have some views as to why that's happened. Um, I think um, you know, everyone talks about pent-up demand, uh, and I think the way I kind of think about it is, you know, in a typical year there's 10 million vehicles sold in this country, sometimes 10.4, 10.6, depending on what's happening in the new car market. But, Broadly 10 million units sold. And very simply, the way I think about it is you've got 30% in Q1, 30% in Q2, 25% in Q, sorry, start again, 30% in Q1, 30% in Q3, 25% is how I think of Q2, and then 15% in Q4. It's up or down, plus or minus a little bit, but big picture stuff, that's kind of where I think of it. If you think about when lockdown happened, which is the 23rd of March, uh, that clearly was the, about the worst time you could pick for our sector. So, you know, the, the busiest week or the busiest month in what certainly had been a busy period for a lot of retailers, particularly as I think since Boris won the election, I think a lot more confidence come back, coming back into the marketplace. And one of the things that we talked about in the RNS that we put out on the 1st of June when we reopened our operations is the fact that we at Marshall were 20% uh, better than the market. So we were absolutely flying, flying. Um, and I think certainly a lot of people that have been watching indeed on your interviews uh, and uh, other sort of uh, media I've been reading had sort of all indicated that Q1 was tracking very, very positively. So I guess in my own mind, you kind of look, think, well, you lost that last week, it, you know, which a lot of people hold off for because what they want to do is they, that there is a perception they'll get a better deal because you see a lot of tactical activity done in that last week of March. Um, plus you would have lost April and May broadly. So... If you think about that volume, you maybe lost five or six percent of the full year in that last week of March. If you said there's roughly 25 percent done in Q2, but obviously you've got Easter, depending on when Easter would have been, but you could say maybe 15 to 17 percent of the full year volume would have been lost in that period. Plus, obviously, some business was transacted. So the way I think of it is probably 20 percent of the full year in terms of volume was lost as a result of that. I appreciate it's a big picture and it's a little bit anecdotal, but with a bit more science to it. So there's 2 million customers that ordinarily would have bought uh, that have yet to come out. Of course, a lot of things that have happened as well uh, from a manufacturing perspective is the finance companies uh, took a very responsible approach. Um, and in fact, um, I would say all of our partners did exactly that. One or two finance companies didn't, but certainly none of the ones that we dealt with. But um, subsequently, the FCA wrote to all of the finance companies and said, what you need to do is you need to be fair in terms of treating your customers around extensions. Uh, so you've kind of seen this three month extension sort of kick in. In fact, the FCA last week announced a uh, further extension to that. So broadly, the way I think of it is 2 million customers didn't transact. Now let's assume, you know, we, we've seen unemployment go from around the million mark to 2.8 million and there's 26.5 million people that work in this country. So roughly 1.8 million, jobs out of 26.5 is about 8%. So let's say 8% of consumers now won't buy because they've lost their jobs. And then you'll have a, a percentage of people, let's just say it's double that, who are anxious, which is understandable given what's going on, uh, who also are saying, well, I'm not going to change my car because I'm worried about the, environment, the, the economy. So there's still 1.6 million customers there or thereabouts who are going to change their cars. And let's not forget, you know, if you look at new cars, new cars, we know over 80% of our customers are in an event-driven transaction, i.e. a PCP. Uh, and I mean, recent years, we've seen used cars uptick as well in terms of PCP penetration. Uh, in fact, for us in 2019, 81% uh, uh, of our customers who bought finance were on a PCP, 63% in finance uh, on used. So those customers have to buy. Okay, And uh, now that, that sort of three-month extension period is now running out, you're going to have a push that's going to come through. 
So that's what we're seeing. I guess the million dollar question on everyone's mind is what's the underlying demand really? I think that, and that is the question that, that many people are asking, Dash, and, and, and unfortunately nobody really knows, do they? Because I mean, we're, we're four or five weeks into this now, and a lot of dealers have reported very, very strong sales, especially in the used car market. Um, yeah. Some that I speak to say they don't think it's going to tail off at all. I mean, what, what's your gut feeling? My view is, as I said, I, I'm thinking of it as 1.6 million broadly big brush numbers of transactions that are going to be incremental in Q3 because of this you know, extension period. I guess you probably would do 3 million maybe transactions in ordinarily in Q3. So does that mean if you take 1.6 onto your 3 million, you're going to see a 50% increase in the market? Who knows? But let's just say the market ended up being 20% up for the sake of argument. Does that therefore mean the underlying market is really 20%, 30% down? Does that make sense? So one of the things uh, I'm quite keen to understand, and we will do analysis on them, um, I'm very data-driven in the way that I run the business, and um, is we will start to analyse you know, what customers bought in Q3 that ordinarily would have been a Q2 customer. And I think it's going to be very difficult to do because clearly there's a lot of work that you've got to do to analyse that. Uh, but it will give you a sense and we'll speak to our finance partners to try and get that data for us. And then if you say, well, let's discount those customers who have bought in Q3 that should have bought in Q2, that will give you a bit of an indication in terms of what happened, what the real market is in Q3. And of course, in the background, what you've got is the uncertainty around the economy, because of course, for the first time, uh, people will start to have to contribute to the furlough scheme in August. So you may well see that some companies, uh, not just in our sector, every sector will start to make redundancies as a result because they don't want to pay uh, the cost of that. I mean, for us, it's £300,000 would be the cost of us picking up the uh, cost of national insurance and pension. So it's a big number. Um, so some companies will just say, you know what, let's take the pay now. Uh, obviously, it then goes up from, uh, from September and then clearly uh, further again in October. So what you might see is you might see 2.8 million job losses go to, I don't know, 3 million, 3.1, and it might just uptick. And I, 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 you know, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw 4, 4 million people unemployed in this country. And I really pray to God that I hope that, that I'm wrong on that. But, of course, none, nobody knows the million-dollar question on that, you know. Um, Dash, what's your, what's your feeling on, when, while we're on the subject of redundancies of, of how this redundancies are going to flow through to the, the motor retail sector? I mean, I know that staffing is incredibly important to, to marshals and, and you personally, but all businesses are having to look at the, the staffing numbers they've got. I mean, what do you think is going to happen in this industry in terms of percentages of how many people may lose their jobs? So it's hard to call. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that's very clear is there are a lot of operations that are being shut. So let's just kind of talk about what I call structural changes. Um, and, that, and that's not a surprise because, again, there's been lots and lots of research out there about the number of retailers that will exist post-2025. And I think most, most people, and I would probably concur with this view, and it's something that I've always held a view of anyway, that by 2025, there will be fewer retailers and there's you know, subjectivity as to what that number would be. But in my own mind, I'd kind of always thought you'll see a reduction between 20 and 25% naturally by 2025. Uh, of course, this is not new because obviously you will have seen a number of manufacturers have announced restructures, you know, so uh, you'll be familiar that, um, you know, uh, Vauxhall have done that, Honda, Ford, and, and actually what they've done, those manufacturers, I think have taken a responsible approach to recognizing that, they want to protect the viability. So I think, you know, commend those three manufacturers for making those tough decisions. But fundamentally, it's the right thing to do for uh, protecting the viability. So you'll have some of those uh, shutdowns happen now. And I think all that COVID-19 has done is accelerate that decision far faster uh, to now. Um, and again, obviously, you've seen lots of coverage around that. So you'll have the structural closures. And I guess what I would say is a lot of these will be the, you know, the smaller businesses uh, that will go. And of course, um, uh, you know, if you've got a kind of hub and spoke territory or a, a market area, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll basically have the smallest one go uh, in, in, in what you'll see there. So clearly, let's just say it's 20 percent is my gut feel. Maybe 15 to 20 percent will happen in the next 12, 12 months. We're already seeing that accelerate. So you might see maybe 
you know, I think four and a half thousand retailers today, you could, I could see that maybe dropping down to just about 4,000, maybe in the next 12 months. Uh, there's a lot of momentum that's been taking place now on this particular topic. Uh, a lot of big groups are doing that. Um, so I think that that will, that will happen. Secondly, I think some people are uh, taking the decision to evaluate their cost base in, in expectancy of a declining market. So the latest SMMT forecast for 2021 is 2.1 million. Now that's a decline on 2019. No point in looking at uh, 2020, but it's a decline on 2019 of 7%. So some retailers are clearly anticipating a tougher time and they're taking cost actions, which again, well documented and, and uh, you'll be aware of that. Uh, and then you're, you've also got a sort of an interesting dynamic that's almost been created as a result of lockdown, because I think what people are looking at all of a sudden is actually looking at the model and are realizing that there are some uh, efficiencies that potentially can be driven. Because when you look at the productivity that's coming out of uh, the operations today, you're seeing a significantly higher productivity with, with less people. So some groups are taking advantage of that. Um, I guess from a, so, so those three dynamics, network reorganization, um, some people looking at cost based in anticipation of a declining market. And then thirdly, this dynamic around uh, productivity that's come through as a result of uh, reactivating post lockdown. They will be one or two or three of the reasons why groups are doing this. Now, I am aware um, from just call it market intelligence that I'm aware that practically every dealer group uh, is taking those kind of actions. Okay. Uh, we're not, I have to say, and I'm, you know, um, we, we have not take, making any decision in respect to redundancies. Um, I'm quite proud of the fact that we've never made any sort of wholesale redundancy in the 13 years that I've been here as CEO. That doesn't mean never say never, because obviously what none of us know is what's going to happen in the future. So if I take post-Brexit uh, vote in 2016, the market has actually fallen around 16%. So 16 down to 19, it's fallen um, 16%. But the strategy we took as a business is no, we're going to take a strategy to grow our business. And we've actually grown our business every single year, 16, 17, 18, 19, every year we've grown. And over that period, we've grown it by 7%. So actually market's down 16, we're up seven, like for like that is. So it's a fantastic performance. So our strategy has been steel market share. Okay. But of course, every year when you've got, if you think it's 16%, it's an average of 4% drop. What we don't know is if next year it ends up being 15, 16%, my chairman always says to me, you know, what you guys at Marshall have done is a fantastic job of uh, swimming against the tide and swimming really, really hard. And we've always, we've always won because we've always been able to beat that downward trend by growing our business like flight. The challenge that we've got this time is, boy, James, we've got a flipping big tsunami coming at us potentially. And no matter how good a swimmer you are, uh, no matter what you do, you can't, you can't beat something like that. That said, we are going to sit by. We're not going to take actions, um, you know, even though it's going to cost us 300 grand, for example, as I said, just in August, and that will only go up from there. We're going to take our time. We're going to assess the situation, assess the market. We're going to run the business tightly. We're going to steal market share, which is how we're setting up to succeed. Uh, clearly, if the market ends up being very difficult, which I don't think you'll see in Q3, then we have to look at our business. But that will be the last thing we want to do. We want to protect the business and ultimately protect jobs and the fantastic culture that we have in our business. So, Dash, a couple of points on that one. Um, you you raised some very interesting things there. I mean, uh, firstly, how many people have you still got on furlough? Um, uh, so, as of today, we have 21% uh, of our people still on furlough, so 79% are back. Um, so, if you look at the 21% of people that are back, so it's roughly about... Uh, What's that? About one, just about, just over a thousand people, roughly. Yeah. But if you look at the thousand people that are, um, actually, it's less. That's probably about nine hundred people. Um, it's about nine hundred people. But if you look within those nine hundred people, uh, a big chunk of those people are drivers. And the reason we've got so many drivers, and I'm, I haven't got the numbers off the top of my head, but it's probably about four hundred, five hundred of those nine hundred are drivers, because in the main, these are being used for. Uh, for ourselves, we're doing collection and delivery. And if you look at the uh, just the health and safety dynamic around collection delivery, getting people in and out of cars uh, with COVID out there, we didn't feel was the right thing to do. One, from a consumer perspective, and secondly, from the perspective of the health and well-being of our colleagues. Uh, and in particular, if you think about a lot of those drivers, generally they are um, retired people who are a little bit older. 
um, and clearly they invariably are sort of more likely to be in that vulnerable category. So from a health and safety perspective, we're not doing that. So I kind of, I kind of discount those a little bit really. Um, interestingly, actually, whilst we're talking about that, no one's making any complaints about the fact that we don't do collection delivery, you know, which is really, really interesting uh, at all. I've not had one complaint. And I know when I talk to a lot of other senior people in the industry, no one else is generally, only a only handful of people doing collection delivery. Um, but again, it has dri driven some efficiencies around uh, the process because all of a sudden you haven't got the reliance on having an additional process in there. So, um, and it it's been quite interesting because we're forcing delivery appointment times the customers understand why we've got appointment times and actually it's driving a lot of efficiencies in our business. So, um, so it's about 900 people that answer your question, James, but as I said, it did out maybe 500 of those because that is a strategic decision and we've decided to take. Because, and there will be a lot of other dealer groups out there. You've mentioned that a lot of them are already considering redundancies. We've already seen a number of other big dealer groups. Look has announced 1,500, 1,500 job losses. Um, this, this is something that many people out there on furlough are still going to be worried about. Um, I mean, what, what would you say to those people? I mean, I, I, it, it's very difficult to speak for other dealer groups, I know, but you know, you're close to this industry. You know what, what's happening out there. Is, is it time for those people to start looking for jobs in other places because their jobs have already been lost? I think, listen, understandably, people are anxious. And it doesn't matter whether you're on furlough, whether you're not on furlough, okay? People are anxious is the reality of it. Um, you know, I mean, I was thinking, James, we, we probably spoke about two months ago, just at the start of the crisis, really, and gosh, a lot's happened in that time, hasn't it, really? Um, but I think if I look at, um, uh, if I look at people who are on uh, furlough today, I mean, we, we have been communicating very regularly to our people, uh, literally, you know, twice a week and, you know, once a week, and I'm going to carry on doing that on an ongoing basis and um, educating and explaining why we're making the decisions. Because right now, what we're trying to do in our business, it's not for me to speak to other people, we're balancing demand versus um customer service levels versus resource versus um uh offsetting against furlough but let's think about what the furlough scheme was put in place for it was designed to protect jobs which is why uh, I, I think a little bit uh, and different people i'm sure will have a different view on this but uh, some people have the view well if you're not likely to bring these people back then you know is it right to take the government's money question mark so let's make the decision now um, I, I have a slightly different view and I appreciate I'm probably one of maybe only a handful of people on this side of the discussion because I'm taking the decision to know I want to give the best possible chance to understand the market, not panic, not make a, a rush decision, even though it's going to cost me 300 grand in August to make that to, to not take those actions and it will only go up from there. But I think that's a responsible thing that you do as an employer. Um, so. I understand why some people are making that, uh, that decision, but I think, as I said to you, I think I said uh, two months ago when we spoke, if you went in strong, you're gonna get through, but you're clearly gonna have an uptick of, an, uh, of debt that's gonna hit your balance sheet. Uh, and the reason you'll have that uptick of debt is because clearly people will be posting losses in the first half of the year. Um, but actually I'll come on to that in a second because it's quite an interesting dynamic around the cash flows of this business, which has surprised, has surprised even me to be honest with you. Um, but if you went in weak and you went in with lots of issues with debt around you uh, and other issues, then, you know, you're going to have to make some pretty tough decisions. And even if you have to make redundancies now to save cost because you're in that situation, then I can understand why people want to make that decision. So the strong will come out. Yes, they'll be slightly weaker, but they'll get through and they will probably be the winners in the long term. The weak, they're going to have a tough time and in the middle middle band are going to be in a situation where they're going to have to re-engineer their businesses and they will take on more debt, which will ultimately make them weaker. Um, the, the other um, stat that you mentioned there, Dash, is the, these 500 dealers you think are going to close in the next 12 months. I mean, that's a big number out of 4,500, isn't it? Um, do you think any of that is going to come from consolidation in the market? I mean, we've, 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 seen, we've seen there are opportunities out there and there probably will be more opportunities. And, you know, we, we know that you're one of those dealer groups that often pounces when you do have the opportunity. Do, do you think that's going to affect dealer numbers going forward? I don't think consolidation as such, because I think what will drive the, it's probably, it, I think consolidation and rationalization are two things. I think the reduction in retailers is gonna come down to, as a result of rationalization, not consolidation. They're two completely different things, because you know, if you bought a, you know, I, we assess acquisition opportunities all the time, every week, literally. Um, but 
why would I want to buy something to then close it? That makes no sense at all. So when I'm looking at businesses, I'm saying, well, what's the brand mix? What's the portfolio? You know, you can have a fantastic brand, but if that brand is in a really difficult market, it's likely not to survive. So why would you want to go and buy that? So the rationalization in the number of outlets, I think is going to come from those smaller regional uh, businesses, you know, in, in places where you kind of think, well, I've never even heard of this location. Why is there a dealer there? And that's where the, the numbers will dwindle. But actually, that's good news for the ones that remain because all that will happen will be the size of the market will be the size of the market. If the number of retailers reduce, that business will have to go somewhere. And effectively, all that does is drive your throughput per site. So if you look at throughput per site over the long term uh, period, so if I, if I take Marshall, when I joined the group, our turnover per site was 9.7 million. Um, and, and that's a function of the fact, quite being really honest with you, we weren't performing back then. Uh, we haven't made a profit for five years. So that was kind of, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, we weren't doing a great job. Secondly, uh, we didn't have the right premix. Thirdly, some of the markets in which we operated were very, very small. Um, a great example I would like to give on this is, you know, we had six Peugeot businesses. If you think about the geography, one in Peterborough, one in Huntingdon, one in Bedford, one in St. Neots, one in Cambridge, one in Bury St. Edmunds. So six sites in a really tight geographic concentration. And that's, that was really a legacy from probably the early 2000s uh, where Persia had an 8.5% market share. The market share dropped uh, and being candid, those six businesses when I joined the group were losing a million pounds. Roll forward, working with the brand, I think they've done a fantastic job with their brand and re re uh, energizing the, the network and the image of the brand. I think David Peel's gonna take a lot of credit uh, for what they've done with that business, same with Alison Jones. They've rationalized the network. We only have three now, so we exited three of those businesses. Now there's only three, but those same businesses now make two million pounds a year. So just because all of that business is now going to go to the other three. So that's where the rationalization will come. I think in terms of consolidation, I think there will be, um, my, I feel very strongly about this. I think what will happen will be, uh, whereas I thought this might have happened over maybe eight to 10 years, that you would see kind of the emergence of maybe five or six super groups. I think that's going to happen far faster. I think what you will see is in the next maybe five, Three, five years, you might see, you know, a, a sort of number of groups breaking away into that kind of five billion plus category. So uh, clearly, you know, there are a, a, some that are already there, some fantastic operators like Sitner and Arnold Clark, phenomenal machines, uh, really well run businesses. Uh, and, I, and I think what you'll see is further businesses come through the ranks um, uh, and, and take advantage of what's out there in terms of consolidation. Have you got an appetite to be one of those super groups, Dash? Nah. <laughs> Why don't I believe you? In Cambridge, James, we're sleeping in Cambridge. I don't believe you. <laughs> I'll um, I'll try another topic. Um, you, you. Oh, listen, I'll, I'll answer the question. Okay, I'll answer the question. I mean, obviously, we review acquisitions all the time. You know, um, we're in a really good position. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we've got. Uh, you know, you will have seen from our update, uh, we actually have virtually no debt. You know, which is a great position to be in. We have no pension deficit. You know, we have no pension liabilities. Uh, we've always taken the long-term uh, decision in the way that we run the business. So we've got no horrible, you know, got one or two, which we've inherited, but broadly we've got no nasty leases. Um, you know, so the business is in fantastic shape. We've got a 120 million uh, revolving credit facility, which again, in our latest RNS, we said we had, uh, you know, pretty much got uh, renewed with our, uh, with our banks. We're just sort of through the final stages of that, which is great. Uh, so from our perspective, we're in a fantastic position. Uh, but when we review acquisitions, it's got to make strategic sense for our business. As I said, there's no point buying businesses to then close them because they're not going to survive in the long term. Uh, you know, we want to buy uh, the right brands in the right markets um, and, and have a really, really good fit to the business. I think we're in a really good place. So why rush uh, on there? But yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely believe when you look at the track record of the business, I mean, we bought and sold 159 businesses now in what is it, uh, 12 years. So, um, and you know, next week, or sorry, in fr this Friday, we'll uh, complete the acquisition of Aylesbury Volkswagen, which we announced back in December, which is part of the sort of businesses uh, that we bought from Jardine Volkswagen. Uh, so they've been a bit delayed on the lease there, but that will complete this Friday. So we'd announced that last year. Um, so, you know, we're an acquisitive group. Um, so I think, joking aside, um, 159 businesses in 12 years. Yeah, I mean, we're, we are one of the one of the consolidated in the marketplace. But 
equally there are one or two others out there. I mean, Robert is a, you know, runs a fantastic operation, has done a great job of being one of the leading consolidators. You know, Mark Lavery as well, same, does a great job. So there are a number of out there, a uh, number of businesses doing, uh, doing this, but what we're not gonna do is just panic. We're not gonna rush out of them. Uh, we watch, we observe, and then we, 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 we strike when it's right. Does the um, buying and selling businesses drive you, Dash? I mean, is, is that what excites you, excites you in business? Um, yeah, I mean, listen, doing acquisitions is great fun, right? You know, it's really, uh, it's really, really good fun. And uh, I was chatting to my team the other day about, you know, the fact we are in such a fantastic position. You know, but, you know if, I, if I look at our business, you know, we've got no debt, no pension li liabilities to come and bite you on the bum. We've got fantastic manufacturer relationships. We've got a great portfolio of brands. Our geographic footprint is south and eastern, uh, with the exception of our northwest Mercedes businesses, but it's Mercedes, fantastic brand. Um, so our, our demographics in our territories are good. We've got very stable management team, very stable management team, uh, not only at my level, sort of year 13 for me now, but even the next level down and the next level down. In fact, I've been doing quality reviews over the last, in fact, I did three today. Uh, we do quarterly quality reviews. So we don't talk about the numbers, p &L, et cetera, just tell me about your staff turnover, tell me about your senior management team. I'm not interested in line managers, just the movers and shakers, as I call them, the GMs. Um, and, you know, it's fantastic. I mean, we've done seven of these in the last week or so. We've got such a strong, stable management team. And I think that makes such a big difference, so we can take advantage of that. Um, you know, and we are an ambitious business. I mean, I'm not 50 yet, James, so don't write me off. Uh, you know, um, we, we're an ambitious team with an ambitious board with a great track record. And, um, you know, in my experience, people want to work for exciting companies and do exciting things. You want, no one wants to come to it. I don't want to come to it. If I have to come to work and do nine to five and just run the day job, that's not exciting. You don't do that anywhere. Uh, people want to come and work for businesses that are going places and they're going to make change. And that's what we're going to do. And, uh, you know, when I talk to my team about it, you know, I will sort of say, look back in when we, when we hang our boots back, hang our boots up and look back. You know, we want to be part of a team that said, yeah, we did exciting things. That's what we did in our career. We made a difference. And that's what people come to work for. And I have heard uh, the saying, don't waste a, don't waste a crisis. And it, it, it certainly sounds like you, you're, you're not going to be doing that. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, Dash, um, just, uh, just a couple of other topics I'd just like to cover. Um, I mean, firstly, um, used cars is, is a massive talking point for the industry at the moment. Yeah. Um, they seem to be flying out. I mean, one, one dealer told me that they were selling five used cars to every new. Um, I'd be interested to know how, how used car performance is for you and also whether you actually managed to get hold of these cars because I know that there's a, there's a big rush at the auctions for them. So, I mean, what, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, take the last point first. Uh, you mentioned auction performance. I mean, the auction performance is nuts, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, I've been tracking data uh, as you know, I'm really into my numbers and into the detail and um, generally uh, data driven. So we track the auction performance, like every time there's an auction, we track it, we look at what's going on in terms of conversion levels. I cannot ever re recollect, and I include 2009 in this, where I've seen auctions convert 100%. I've not seen that. I, I mean, it might have happened in 09, but I can't remember seeing that. But in the last few weeks, we've had a number of auctions, which literally every single car got sold, every single car. I can't, there might, as I said, the last, that may have been 09 when we came up, out from the, uh, the uh, great financial crisis, but I can't remember seeing that, but if I was wrong, I was wrong. But uh, I certainly haven't seen that in the last 10 years, put it that way. So every car being sold at auction. The other thing I haven't seen for a long, 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 long time, and, it, and it, uh, this I did see was in 2009, was um, auction performance at 114%. You know, if you look at the long-term average, it's typically 97.3%, 114%, okay? And it's simple, isn't it? Supply and demand and economics. And I think it's, you know, uh, in fact, James, I, I, in advance of this, um, I did have a look to think, uh, to see what I said in uh, two months ago to make sure I don't kind of contradict myself because you'll only pick me up and beat me up on it. So uh, I did have a little kind of quick rewind and I thought, oh, I'm a bit too boring. I'll just listen to the first 10 minutes. But one of the things I did say, you asked me about residual values back in April, early part of April, and you said, what's my thought? Because I think a lot of people were anxious, understandably. But if you remember, I actually said to you, actually, James, I could make a case to say residual values will go up. And do you remember I said it's because of WLTP, supply and demand, and that's exactly what's happened. So that's great news for the industry. Of course, it's not just great news for the industry, it's great news for our customers. 
uh, and it's great news for our brands because ultimately residual value protection is, is a good thing for everybody. So that's a little bit about the auctions. In terms of used cars, how are we sourcing them? Um, one of the things we've done is really focus on um, uh, order to delivery cycle around um, new cars in particular. Now, one of the things you, you mentioned five to one, I mean, during lockdown at one point, we were 13 to one, 13 yeah. used to one new. So that's basically now starting to come up. But it's understandable why that ratio is what it is, because ultimately the new car customers by and large, where there's a higher penetration of DCP, had a three month extension. So it's understandable. Well, why would you go and buy a new car in the middle of lockdown? One, you couldn't find a dealership. Two, why on earth would you change your PCP when you've got a three, three month extension? To have a new car sat in your drive, collecting dust, and probably pay a slightly higher payment. That's madness. So that's why new, I think, was there. And what we have seen as a trend in the last probably three weeks, I would say, new cars has really started to ramp up now, really started to ramp up. Um, so that ratio has been coming down significantly. Uh, and I predict, I think Q3 is going to be very strong, is my, is my instinct, because of this sort of pent up demand that I was talking about earlier on. So I do think uh, uh, that ratio will come down. I think with that, when that's happening, one of the things we've been doing is pushing really hard to get deliveries out because as you get deliveries out, you get the part exchanges through uh, faster and then, and then you are able to spin around. So again, with that, I can't give you too much in terms of our numbers, but what I would say to you is in terms of our stock turn, you know, our stock turn, I mean, we, 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 uh, in 2019, we had one of the highest stock turns in the sector, 10.9%, which is stunning. Um, eight would be considered good. We were 10.9 last year. In June... Uh, we significantly, I can't give you the number, but we significantly beat that 10.9 just by spinning the stock. So, uh, you know, challenge to my team if you're watching. Guys, I'd like that all year now, please, thank you. Um, but of course, the benefits that is where we drive the newer cars coming in. If you look at where you make margin, you make your margin on the cars that are typically less than 30 days on, particularly those 14 day, zero to 14 day cars. So a huge amount of focus on that, which of course drives cash, drives working capital, drives us part exchanges. One thing which is an interesting trend on use is we talk, you've seen a lot of the research around um, consumers basically not wanting to use public transport. It's one of the things that you've covered, uh, you've covered it a number of times actually in some of your interviews. In fact, I'll tell you what I will say, James, credit to you because um, to be fair, I think you've done a fantastic job for the whole industry, not just for Car Dealer Magazine, because you're on every single day. I don't actually sadly watch all of them, but I do watch quite a number of the ones, particularly the ones I would find interesting. And I think you've done a great job for the industry. So I will say well done to you and thanks for the team because I think it's kept a lot of people going, particularly who have been on furlough and a few people have said that to me. So well done you and well done Cardi the magazine for that. Um, um, how much were you going to pay me for the plug, by the way? Was it, was well, it a great... I, I, I think I could probably use that as quite a good advert now, so thanks. Uh, but no, genuinely, that's sincerely meant. But I think the other thing I would say is if you look at the actual uh, thing that you talked about, which is around consumers wanting to come out of public transport, um, it's interesting where I live in Harkin and a lot of the people uh, get the train to get into London because it's like 25 minutes and a lot of the people are now working from home and I talk to people I haven't been on public transport for well since since lockdown quite frankly and nor do I intend to in the short to medium term um, but I think uh, what I'm hearing is the trains are dead so one of the stats um, that I heard you quote which I've stolen a few times you made reference to data which said 58% of consumers who had a driving license but used public transport said they were going to change a car. Now, what we're seeing as a dynamic is we normally used to have 62%, so all the vehicles we sell, 62% would come in with a part exchange, of which broadly half we would retail, so around 31% of all, all deals. We've seen that 62% figure drop by about 10%, so down to nearer 50. And again, that's too big a drop to be you know, coincidental. Uh, so what that tells me is more people are buying cars who don't have vehicles today and again instinctively that tells you people who don't want to use public transport and then when you get into the segmental analysis in terms of age uh, and again you'll see this with cap uh, and their commentary that they put out last week in terms of the book it's the older cars sort of you know sub 10k that are doing really 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 well and in that and in that segment the values actually went up 3.7 percent into june so and late plate cars clearly uh, a little bit of a pressure there uh, but I think that's understandable because as you go into Q3, the OEMs are going to put on very, very attractive and, and are putting on very attractive new car offers to incentivize these customers to, to basically change now and go into new cars. I mean, that was going to be my, my, my next question on the new car front. I mean, we ran a story this morning of some interesting uh, research from CarWow that they, they asked their, um, their, their user base, 
2,000 users, what would be the biggest incentive to buy a new car? And 60% um, 60, 60 of them said a 0% finance deal. I mean, that was above just manufacturer deals and a VAT car. I mean, I thought that's incredible because actually a 0% deal is, is something that's quite common, isn't it, really, in these times. And if, we, if we're going to see large numbers of those put in place, well, that is going to mean good things for new cars. What, what are your thoughts on, on incentives? And, and, and do you think we're going to see anything from the government to help this industry out? I think it's hard to, I think it's hard to call. I mean, again, uh, I, think, I think probably what's going on, but what do I know? Um, I think the government's probably waiting and watching because, you know, if you look at... Uh, uh, Biz, so uh, Department of Business, Enterprise, Innovation, and Strategy. This big mouth, uh, big mouth, all there. Uh, they have got data coming out of their ears. They will be, they will have the ear to the ground. They'll be monitoring transactions uh, in terms of what's going on. You've only got to go on to, um, you know, you you won't, you you won't see me sort of tweet our numbers or anything like that, or go on social media. You'll never see that because we're a public company. But equally, you can go on to LinkedIn and different social media and you'll see people will be comfortable sharing the numbers and that, that's absolutely fine so they will be monitoring what's going on in terms of demand uh, obviously the data's come out today for june around minus 35 percent um and I, I my suspicion is they're just waiting to see what happens whether the sector does need stimulus or not um i guess in the short term given this pent-up demand it pr arguably doesn't need uh stimulus in the short term the bit that I think most people are anxious is around Q4 and into 2021. That's that's the point. In terms of what stimulus looks like, it's hard. It's it's you know there's no there's no sort of silver bullet because if you went to scrappage, um, how does that benefit a premium brand um, such as JLR? You know, fantastic. Um, you know, UK based manufacturing one of the biggest success stories for over the last you know decade or so in terms of uh, you know manufacturing in this country and something that you know whether you're the Labour government or the Conservative government, you were very proud of it. You look at the supply chain, it's had a huge impact on the UK economy, JLR. But how does Scrappage convince uh, somebody to go and buy a brand new JLR product? It probably doesn't. So is that fair uh, to, to benefit one end of the market, which is probably you know, the volume end versus the premium end? So whatever, whatever happens, you're not going to please everybody. I think personally, whatever happens needs to be fair to all manufacturers. So... Uh, is it some sort of, you know, I mean, VAT cuts being, being muted, um, you know, that would be good. Uh, but again, it would need to be, it would need to be attractive, in my opinion, because, um, you know, cars have gone up because of a weakening sterling. So sterling's now one one ten today to euro. Um, so, you know, there's no point doing two and a half percent. It would need to be, I don't know, 10 percent rather than 20 percent VAT uh, or VAT free would be lovely. But I don't think the government's going to be able to afford to do that. I don't know. Um, so I think I think some form of stimulus is needed. My personal view is I suspect if there is going to be anything done, if anything is done, it might be at a later stage once the government understands exactly what's going on there in terms of the, this kind of underlying health of the uh, automotive industry um, and whether that's even maybe even done post Q3 because they've got to do the analysis to see what really was from Q2. We have to wait and see. Dash, um, uh, just to finish on, on, on a couple of more personal questions. I mean, how have you how have you coped with lockdown? I mean, I know you've been working in, incredibly hard. I mean, I mean, how has it affected you personally? Do you know what? Actually, I, I, I actually this is an awful thing to say. We've actually had a really good lockdown. You know, we have. I mean, if I look at the things I look at as a business, so uh, my management team and I have been meeting twice a week on Zoom calls. We used to meet on a regular basis, but not twice a week. Uh, so as a, as a sort of top team, my executive, we've had Jamie and John on before. You know, I'll be honest with you, that has been revolutionary. And we will carry on doing that, no question. So if we hadn't had lockdown, we wouldn't have had that ability to drive the efficiencies. And, you know, poor old John used to drive all the way from Hook up to Milton Keynes for the meeting. Steve, our co who you've probably seen drumming. Uh, you know, uh, he used to travel all the way down from Birmingham. Joe, my HR director, is from Hull. Uh, Jamie was quite local as was Richard, our CFO. But you know, it's it's a, they lose probably a day just in travel. You know, so you think actually that's been really good. So it's, it, what was a tight team has become even tighter, uh, and uh, yeah, we've, we have a lot of fun usually at my expense. Uh, but uh, that's been good and with the ops team. You know, the ops board we used to do that once a month. Uh, we're now doing that weekly. You know, but shorter, more pacier meetings. 
Um, you know, with the, uh, we used to do regular management conferences. We do one in January, kickstart year, with the sales and service managers and GMs. Then we will do one in, uh, after our results in, uh, in May, then some uh, price of the budget session in October. So we do three conferences a year. We're now doing that, believe it or not, every two weeks, literally every two weeks on team working. We have about 450, 450, 460 managers come on that. And the feedback's phenomenal because you can do it in 35, 40 minutes. We're having Q&A and at our conferences, you'll get a few questions. We're getting like 39, 40 questions, seriously. Uh, and because you can type it anonymously, it's amazing the number of you know, people are really opening up. And actually, I think what's um, uh, what's been fantastic is because uh, you know uh, our IT guy said, "Oh, we can we can screen all the questions." Okay, uh, I said, no, "No, no, no, you put every question up there." Okay, because I, if people are worried, I want to answer them straight. Because actually, it's, and actually, one thing I'm really proud of, we did. Um, uh, we asked them, how did you, um, so we asked them after each session, so this Thursday will be our fourth one. We asked them, how did, did you feel management answered the questions honestly? Uh, and last week, 100%. Literally, you know, you know three figures of, I think it's 125 people uh, responded to the survey. All of them said we felt we answered the questions 100%. And I always say, look, you might not like the answers you're going to get, you know, but I'll tell you the truth, you know. Um, it's a bit like, you know, people sort of said, are we making redundancies? No, the answer is no, we're not making redundancies. And there is no plans today to do that. But you can never say never. If the economy is really, really awful in Q3, then you have to, then you have to look at the business. But we will fight hard and do everything that we can to protect the business and to protect jobs for the long term. So that's been powerful. Uh, our business from a cash perspective is phenomenal. Our business from a trading perspective has been phenomenal. Um, the, the team we, we got, uh, we picked up um, uh, 60 in a row. In fact, stay there, don't move. We'll stay here, so, we'll go anyway. so, so we got the sixth one of those in a row. Nice, um, that's a good deal. So, awesome to receive. Yeah, so you know, we were really proud of that, which again sort of talks about the culture that we've got. Um, I think the other thing that's happened is uh, we've had a lot of profile in, in the media, and to be honest with you, that. I can tell you categorically, James, who set this up? Who set this up? Well, yeah. you, well, you, you contacted me. Oh, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but most people have basically, uh, most people have sort of been contacting us. And they're sort of said, yeah. I mean, when, so if you look at the profile that the business has had, be that on Sky News twice, be that on ITV, be that in the mail, the independent, you know, all of that. We, they've come to us, which, you know, we're not out there sort of saying, oh, please come and interview us, please come and talk to us. And I think, so the business has got, in, I would say, has enhanced its reputation through this period. And I think part of that has been because of the way we treat our people, the way we treat our customers. We've done, we've acted responsibly through the furlough period. We've enhanced people's earnings. Uh, we've been there to support the uh, key worker community through lockdown. Um, so I think reputation, I think we had a really good reputation going in anyway. I think our rep reputation has been enhanced. Um, I think our relationships with OEMs was, was always very, very strong. Uh, I think that's enhanced through this process as well. And I've got to say they've uh, all acted fantastically as well. So I, 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 I genuinely, that's what I said at our board meeting, lockdown's actually been really good for this business. And I think, you know, as I said, if you went in strong, you're coming out, you know, you will come out strong, but you may be a little bit weaker. But actually, I think in all of those key metrics, we've done really well. And, and right now, the, our people, um, the, 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 quite frankly, the love for the company right now in our business is amazing. And uh, we are being inundated. I mean, that is the only word I can use to describe what's happening. We are being inundated with people wanting to come and work here. It's a fantastic position to be in. I mean, literally, I mean, today I've had six CVs already this morning. Uh, of people who want to come and work here so we're, we're in a really and, and just look back on the redundancy point that's what happens is it's not the good it's not the bad people that get made redundant sorry it's not the you know generally when people get made redundant you know people will look for the weakest performers and then the ones that go but if you're on a business which is making big redundancies it unsettles the good ones doesn't it and it's the good ones that are applying to us you know so from, from a personal perspective i think we've um, you know we've come out of it really well from a business perspective we've come out of it really well it gives me pride to see, you know, the feedback that we're getting from our colleagues um, and the appreciation they have, and they feel really proud and, uh, to be part of the organisation. Um, so now, I'm, and then personally, you know, I'll be honest, I've never <laughs> worked so bloody hard in my life. It has been knackering. It really has been exhausting. But to be honest with you, 
I mean, I've always been, my chairman calls me a junkie because uh, he said I'm a work junkie. But I, I, I don't think I'm, you know, a junkie because I, I, work's not work. You know, work, work is fun and you, it's just a bonus you get paid to do it. And uh, the day I don't enjoy it is the day I'm quitting, you know. Um, so, but that's good. Yeah, so um, apart from being, being a media star, what, what, what's next for, uh, what's next for, for Dash Gupta? Are you, is he going to be the, uh, the boss of a five billion uh, turnover, turnover dealer group or is there something else up to sleep? Listen, this business absolutely has the potential to be one of those uh, top, you know, five or six big super groups, as I'm referring to them. Uh, I've got absolutely no doubt we will be one of those. But do we do that now? Do we do that in the next two, three years? Do we do that in five years? That's the million dollar question I don't know. What we're not going to do though is rush something. We're ready to do it if we want to. We're in a great position to do it. But we'll only do it, as I said, where it makes strategic sense for the business and it makes financial sense for our shareholders. Um, but to, has this business got the potential and everything lined up? 100% it has, yeah, for sure. Dash, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for joining me today. I wish you best of luck with, uh, with the rest of the year. Thanks, James. Good to see you. Look at yourself. Bye, everyone. So thanks ever so much for uh, Dash Gupta for, uh, for uh, joining us today um, for more Cardio and Lives like this one. You can log on to cardiomagazine.co.uk, click the live tab at the top of the page, and you'll be able to find lots of them like Dash's interview. Thanks ever so much for joining us. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.